a short 15 verse chapter. We've had a few things interrupting and moving and things like that. So let's finish um, what really was a message now a few weeks ago, um, finishing up with uh, the enemy, which is beginning there in verse 7. All right. So it's closer than you think. We're going to get to the great white throne tonight. And I urge you to go ahead and get your uh, handout ready so we can fill in some blanks in just a moment. So some 6,000 years ago, God created all this. Now upon each of the six days work that he did, he said it was good. That's those are powerful words. In fact, uh, Genesis 1.31 says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. That's not a surprise to us who have any kind of a relationship, especially a personal relationship with our Creator. For we know this, the Bible records on a couple of occasions in Philippians and Romans that he is doing a good work in us each and every day. Now, after the passing of some time, just a chapter in the scriptures, we come to when things begin to go sideways, Genesis chapter 3. That good became corrupt with sin, causing everything to go haywire. God's created world now has been witnessing this haywire ever since. That is, until we get to the great white throne. And so, as we see this unfold, let's read the scriptures together. A few verses now, and a few more in a minute. Revelation 20, verse 7, when the thousand years are expired... We took our detour last week and spent the entire message talking about the thousand years. And that is going to be a great time, a time of, of healing, a time of restoration, a time of, of uh, I think, joy and jubilation, a time of innocence because the devil's not going to be around but ultimately, that's not the end of it all. So, after the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Remember, he's just been cast into the bottomless pit at the Battle of Armageddon. He's going to go out and deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, so there will be a a remnant of, of evil, I guess you can say. Those who the goodness of God has not even affected. And, you know, it's uh, Jeremiah that tells us that the heart is desperately wicked. And so there will still be those, even though they are in a state of bliss in the thousand-year millennium, that will not believe in Jesus. And there will still be reproduction going on. And so there will be thousands, if not millions, of people born in a thousand years. And so there will be, then, the opportunity for the devil to go out and deceive all over the world, in the four quarters, all around, basically. Another army called Gog and Magog. This is a revival of a theme that goes all the way back to Ezekiel 38 and 39. Gog and Magog in particular, if you want to think about it geographically, would be in the China-Russia type segments of the world. Um, so you can kind of make that whatever you will to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So we see right there that there's going to be a large portion of that day's population that never comes to know Jesus, which is 
odd since we know a little bit about the thousand year millennium and how that the devil won't even be around i mean tell me how evil man is if the devil doesn't even have to be around and we still don't turn to jesus as a, as a race or as humans uh thankfully again now let me just remind you thankfully you know the rapture's already happened we've been in I mean, we haven't even been a part of the tribulation, the seven years, so definitely we've been with Jesus this whole time. By this time, we've participated in the marriage supper, the, the, the consummation of our time with Jesus has taken place, and, and we're, we're on a whole other realm by this time. We've got our glorified bodies. I mean, it's, it's great for us, uh, except for the fact that I think we're going to get to witness this, and this is definitely going to be something where i'm glad we're going to have a complete mind to where we think like jesus at that point and we see things from his perspective not from our natural perspective which would certainly feel sorry for these people right or feel mm, maybe not sorry but but just kind of maybe even a little confused about why there's so many people well first of all the word of god says it so it's got to happen right so secondly, I mean, we, just, we are just going to finally have the mind of Christ so we'll know uh, why all of this is happening as it is. Verse 9, they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, that would be Jerusalem, so evidently there's going to be one last rush on God's earthly capital. The capital city that God chose on the earth is Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Can we all say amen or shout out a hallelujah? Or can we give, him a, give, God, give God a standing ovation or whatever it takes, right? Where the beast and the false prophet already are shall be tormented day and night forever and ever as he should be verse 11 i saw a great white throne then and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away there was found no place for them the earth and the heaven anymore okay so let's uh let's first of all finally get rid of satan all right we've had to take that pause for the thousand years let's get satan terminated all right that's where we start tonight is the termination of Satan. Harkening back to a couple of weeks ago's notes, we've continued with the letter T. All right? So Satan is terminated. Unlike what we've been reading uh, prior to this, the thousand-year reign, this battle is going to be brief. I mean, there's not going to be much to this fight just like there wasn't much fight at the Battle of Armageddon. Remember when Jesus rides in and, and just absolutely annihilates people with the truth. All right, the sharp sword that goes out of his mouth, he conquers. We don't even get to do anything but just watch and ride on a really cool horse. All right, unlike the horse I rode in or on in Riadosa back in the day. So fire comes from God which devours all the rebels is about the best way we can sum up what we just read in verse 7 and following. The devil gets his final judgment, and that'll be in the lake of fire. He will join the beast and the false prophet there, and that would be the only logical final resting place for the unholy trinity to be is in the lake of fire also known as hell okay so satan's terminated let's move on then to what we saw in verse 11 i saw that great white throne him that sat on it whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them so we get the great white throne appearing Okay, the great white throne appearing in verse 11. At this point, i got to be honest with you. I obviously, and, and you probably too, have read through the Revelation 
on numerous occasions, and it's always at this particular moment that I get this kind of shivery feeling. I get this kind of lump in my throat because I believe that we are going to witness this. Okay? I'm also going to go ahead and say something fairly controversial. You all right with that? If we're going to witness this, I'm not so sure that we won't be emotional about this. Because there's been a lot of songs written about no tears in heaven. But I'm not so sure that there won't be tears shed right here. Because it will be for sure for certain that we will know some of these people that appear before the great white throne. I get a little scriptural help from that because literally verse, it's chapter 21 that tells us that the tears will be wiped away. So again, a little controversial. I don't know. Again, my, my debate with myself, do you ever do that? Debate with yourself? My debate with myself about this is at that point in time, we will have the mind of Christ. And we will have been able possibly to see and know, hey, they had opportunities, you know? And maybe even at that point, we're just thankful that we heard the call of the Holy Spirit and, and trusted Christ as our Savior. Because this, this to me is just going to be awful. I can't, I can't see anything past it. Every time I come to the Scripture, again, I kind of kind of get the shivers, and I, I just had them all over my body, and, and also kind of get a little bit of a lump in my throat because I think about how serious this time is going to be. It's going to be an awesome scene depicted by John's revelation. Even the description, I think, takes our breath away just a little bit. I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. The Creator has just uncreated through this fire judgment. Okay? The Creator, get this, has just uncreated through this fire judgment. I want you to see this in the scriptures okay we know that uh, verse mm, 9 tells us at the very end and fire came down from god out of heaven and devoured them now in second peter chapter 3 flip back there second peter you'll find it uh, just behind from this direction first john Second Peter chapter 3 and verse number 10. There's three verses here that coincide with John's revelation. The Bible is very good about giving us more than one reference on many subjects, and this is one of them. So 2 Peter 3.10 says, But the day of the Lord will come. Okay, all this is going to happen as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and get this, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be, say it with me, burned up. I love verse 11. Seeing then that these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation all holy behavior and godliness looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of god wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat so there is a there's a obviously a question there what kind of person what kind of people ought we be to be in light of the fact that this great white throne's coming and just prior to that there's going to be a complete annihilation of everything we've known, the heavens and the earth. Now that's quite interesting, isn't it? So again, after this happens, this annihilation, verse 11 
brings up the great white throne. All right? So then this verse describes the fill of the void in time. Where is this going to happen? Not sure. But God, who said, let there be light, and there was light, surely can say, let there be a great white throne, and there's going to be a great white throne, right? Um, pretty good chance that this happens in heaven, but we can't be totally certain. The only reason I say that is because we're about to find out that there's some books there, all right? And these are books that probably are going to be books that are in heaven even at this particular time. So again, uh, this verse describes a void of time. Actually, if you want to go back to the Old Testament with me real quick, we might not get to this chapter of Daniel for quite some time. So go ahead and look up Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Again, comparing Scripture with Scripture, making sure that we're all on the up and up. Another reference of this is Daniel 7, 9, and 10. You can get a little bit more of the scene. I beheld till the thrones were cast down. I'm in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down. That would be a depiction of the heavens coming to the judgment of the fire of God. The Ancient of Days, capital A on Ancient, we're talking about God. The Ancient of Days did sit. Well, where's he going to sit according to Revelation? On the great white throne whose garment was white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, a thousand thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. That's going to be us. Okay? Okay. The judgment was set. Verse 10 says, the books were opened. Okay, so this great white throne appears, and now let's go back to Revelation 20 and verse 12, and let's talk about the two books. Okay, the two books. I saw the dead, um, small and great, stand before God. The books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. They were judged, every man, according to their works. So with these two books, we note that the dead of all time will be resurrected. The dead of all time will be resurrected. Except for those, obviously, that have been born again and have been resurrected already with Jesus. Right? Okay? But anybody of all time that has never trusted Jesus Christ will be at this great white throne. Bible records two books will be opened. The first book is called the book of life. This book testifies against the dead. Okay, I'll give you a second to write those two things down. The first book that's opened is the book of life. That seems to kind of explain itself, doesn't it? That those who have trusted Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, the life, and come unto the Father by Him, are written in this book. True? All right, we all, <laughs> I almost said, are we on the same page? Get it? But anyway, um, so, then, everybody that's written in this book testifies against those that aren't. Make sense? 
obviously then, it's because that they are not part or had not been part of what's called the first resurrection. The first resurrection is talked about back up in verse 5 of chapter 20. But the rest of the dead lived not until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So the first resurrection is the resurrection to go and have a glorified body and be with Jesus and then serve for a thousand years with Jesus under his earthly reign. Anybody who has not been a part of that first resurrection dies, but then gets a bodily resurrection to go back before the great white throne. So as we have getting as we are getting excuse me, as we have already gotten our glorified bodies that will last forever, isn't that amazing? We're not gonna grow old, we're not gonna age, no more birthday cake, no more nothing like that, because we don't need it anymore. The glorified body lasts forever. Well, the people who are being condemned into hell also will go down there with a body as well. And that's the body that they are getting right now that will also last forever in torment. That's awful, isn't it? I'm telling you, man, the great white throne, this is some serious stuff. And it's not something to be taken lightly, but it's recorded in the Bible. Thankfully, so we'll know. And maybe thankfully, so we'll do what Peter said. What kind of persons ought we to be right now? Knowing these things, that we ought to probably be a little bit better witnesses. Tell people a little bit more about the Lord. Be a better, brighter light in our world. Again, uh, the next book then, after the book of life, is the book that contains each of these people's works. So you can imagine the millions of people that have never trusted Christ, that are going to be there, and every one of their works is going to be recorded in this book. That's some kind of book. Either that or some mighty fine print. I don't know which. So since we know that our works do not justify us before God, we know that they are going to be condemned by their works all right and remember romans chapter 3 tells us that i'll read it to you real quick romans chapter 3 and verse 20 therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in the, in god's sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin but now the righteousness of god without the law is manifest is made known being witnessed by the law and prophets even the righteousness of god which is by faith of jesus christ unto all that are upon them that believe for there is no difference there's no difference all of sin and come short of the glory of god we know verse 23 being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in christ jesus down in verse 28 therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law so no matter how many good deeds were done by these people that are standing before God at the great white throne judgment, there's no justification there. Why? Because there's still sin. The righteousness of Christ has not covered that sin because they've never trusted in Jesus. As the Bible says, by grace, through faith. So out of this book, the works of unbelievers will be judged. Uh, an interesting thought about this that comes out, and I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, hell's hell, okay? It's eternal. It's hot. It's tormenting. It's all. But the books are actually going to determine the severity of the hell for each person. 
we could make all kinds of judgments in regards to that. Is hell going to be hotter for Hitler than it is for, you know, average Joe? I don't know. More than likely. Why? Because of this book that's recorded all of his works. You see what I'm saying? So, so that's another reason why there has been an account because of the severity of hell being different for different people. Does that make sense? I'm just going to throw that out there. You can study that more on your own. There's, there's really uh, some great stuff out there. Uh, but what we do know is hell is not going to be pretty for anybody. Um, and and uh, um, so it's, it's just going to be awful. But we also, I think, kind of come to the understanding that hell is going to be worse for some than others. You can better bet that it's going to be the hottest and the most uh, awful for Satan and the demons. Right? Because that's who hell was created for. So finally, we get in verses 14 and 15 a forever term of punishment. A forever term of punishment. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And this is a forever judgment. So we find out that death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. This is where the beast and the false prophet are. And where the devil just joined them. We also find out that uh, see, gave up their dead, delivered the dead. They were judged every man. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's a tough one. Because that could be some of our relatives. That could be some of our friends. That could certainly be our neighbor. Kind of scary. And the lake of fire is an eternal place. The um, Bible says that this death is the second death or... For clarification, their eternal place. Just as we will be in eternal bliss, never hurting again with Jesus in a perfect situation, uh, perfect climate, no more allergies. Can I get an amen to that? Um, no more roller coaster ride of temperatures, no more want, no more calories <laughs> so i was thinking about what i was going to have for supper tonight sorry i do think about other things when i'm preaching and sometimes i get distracted a little bit um just as we are in fantastic situation those who go to hell are in the worst possible situation you know, out of all the things that I've ever read that really bother me most about hell, it's when Mark records Jesus saying that their worm dieth not. You know what that worm is? That worm is a personal tormentor for each person in hell. That bothers me. Now, the heat, obviously but that there is a personal tormenting always going on. I don't know if it's somebody poking you in the eye the whole time. I don't know if it's somebody that won't turn the water off and just keeps trip, 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 trip. I don't know what the torment's going to be. But I hate to be tormented. Don't you? You know? I mean, we've enough of us have had brothers and sisters to know what torment is, right? both the tormenting and the tormentor that's awful and it's going on forever um 
with 13 saying the sea gave up the dead and the death and hell delivered up the dead means that all the places of holding the dead will give up their dead. That's basically what that means. They're going to all be reunited at the great white throne judgment. Ultimately, they too will be cast into the lake of fire, hell, all of these will be cast. I had an evangelist one time ask the question, didn't he just kind of left it open-ended, and I'll never really forget this. He asked the question, I wonder who's going to do the casting? You know, because to cast something is to physically, you know, I'm not sure. But it's not going to be pretty, is it? Obviously, these are those who are not written in the Lamb's book of life. All others, though, will be cast into eternal punishment in hell. That's bad news. That's a hard place to end tonight. But it is reality. Thankfully, can we at least read verse 1 of chapter 21? And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. There's no more sea. Thankfully, there's more and it's better. And I can't wait to talk about that in a couple of weeks. Okay? Thank you, Lord, for your word. And I pray that we would take your word very seriously. And as we learn, may we uh, improve whatever that means, our witness to those around us. And use your word as motivation to be the witnesses that you have called us to be. Thank you for what you'll do and how you'll use your word to be the catalyst in Jesus' name. Amen.